Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in a bit early. There are 15 people, uh, or 15 households that, that are tuning in at this current time. If you are here, say hi. Say so hi I to can chat. Say hi back. Anyway, how, how are you? You doing okay today? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. You know, we were talking to somebody this morning who like, uh, sometimes when you say I'm doing okay, people are like, oh, what's wrong? But no, like, it's actually okay to be okay. You know, like, I, I think I've come to the point where I'm just like, I don't want to answer I'm good or I'm great unless I am good or great. Yeah, but the problem is, so by saying I'm okay, the, the other person then is going to go, oh, tell me what's going <laughs> That's on. That's exactly what happens. And so it's a lot better just to say, I'm awesome, I'm doing great. And they go, okay, fine, high five, and they're, they're gone. And so it depends on how much time that you have to be authentic in that moment. Yes. So, how are you doing, Michael? I'm awesome. <laughs> okay, anyway, <laughs> um, so thinking about um, coming here today and the sermon series is about to be tied up. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's been since April. There's Has been it a been sermon, that long? Yeah, wow. called Kingdom Culture. And I think, like, I've, I've truly been taught by it, and yeah. I've grown in it, that, that I feel like on the other side, I'm actually a different person. Yeah. Um, how has the sermon series been for you? So I, I'll be completely honest. I, I, well, like, I hope that you would I'll be, be honest. Mostly, well, revelation, I'll be somewhat revelation, honest. Um, 21, eight, 21, eight. What are you doing right now? <laughs> okay, go ahead. I had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> you did. You did. You did indeed. Um, Indeed. So I think, I, I think for me, one of the things I noticed early on in this series is that it seems to me like like Jesus has had. It seems like sometimes Jesus is talking over here to this crowd, and sometimes Jesus is talking over here to this crowd. Yep. And that actually rattled me at first because I think sometimes I read the Bible where I'm just like, oh, this is just one continuous like conversation, conversation, like, yeah, right? Yeah. But if you look at the first several chapters or, or the first several verses in Matthew chapter five, and then as it goes in and into chapter six, it's like, it seems like there's a different tone, right? Well, yeah, because he's talking to different people. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think that's helped me a lot. Um, but I think it's also, I, I think it's important for us to know as we're, as we're um, going through this series and now coming to an end that I'm, I'm wondering, God, where, where do I land? And that, like, who are, what are you trying to say to me as you're talking to this group of people? And what are you trying to say to me as you're talking to this group of people? Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, but then I go and think, like, do you fit kind of each category Yeah. so that there is something for you for each yeah. segment? I don't know. Like, I think that's very interesting to think about. And I'm sure there are different parts to pick and choose from, yeah. but... Well, his tone, too, is like, and I, I think it's probably just, I think it's just an eye-opener for me. Uh, you, you, take about, you talk about, like, one particular set of passages that is three chapters in the Bible, and he is both talking, like, kindly to the ones he loves so dearly and blessing them and speaking life and light and goodness. And then he's like, it's like this kind of thing. It's like, you know, the kind of thing where he's just like, now, for those of you who are doing this, let me tell you this, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, like, don't you just see him changing his posture? It isn't to the same people. It's yeah. it's to the people who have come to judge the people yeah. who are broken and hurting. Yeah. And so he kind of just turns his corner and says, don't yeah. even begin. And I think the beauty in that is is that the, it, it's all coming from the same kind and merciful heart. Like he still has a heart to see both. And, and in this case, it's the religious and the non-religious. He has such a heart for them to come and see and live in the fullness of the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's that's incredible perspective. I mean, in seeing the whole sermon as a whole brings yeah. us to this point. And so, so to. Today's sermon is the final sermon of the Kingdom Culture Sermon Series. Kind of. Kind of. Because 
I have the upcoming sermon. This guy's talking next week. And I'm just going to bring it all back. You're just going to bring it back. I am. I'm bringing it back. So I'm excited to hear how Pastor Allen kind of brings it all together. Yeah. And it's going to be fun. So thank you for being here and for being a part of our church. It is time for us to begin. This is our vision as a church. All things with Christ as a thriving family for all People. And we would love for you to be a part of this journey as we follow Jesus together. Hello, everybody. Hey. Welcome to services yes. today. We are glad that you are here and we've got some information for you. Uh, first thing, we want to welcome back our college students. Uh, we had our college Sunday last week. Um, so if you weren't here and you want to get connected with our college ministry, uh, hang out in the student lounge afterwards. Stetson or Nate would love to meet you and just kind of let you know what's going on. Uh, but there is something going on, Mariana. We've got a college dinner that's gonna be happening this Thursday, September 2nd down at Zoe's. So you'll wanna check that out and just come and have fun and enjoy friends and free food. Next, we just wanna give you a big shout out for the Baby Bottle campaign. This year, we just heard back from the Resource Center that our church alone raised almost $12,000. So good job, church. Thank you for your generosity. And we're so excited how we can support this wonderful ministry in town. I am, I, every year I'm impressed with how our church body just shows up for this incredible nonprofit. So yes. yeah, way to go you guys. Mm -hmm. Hey, we also have uh, some classes that are coming up here in September that we're looking forward to. We've got our FPU class and our Alpha class. And we really wanna highlight our Alpha course for you guys. Um, Alpha, Mariana, what would you say Alpha is? like? Alpha is just this beautiful place for you to get started. If you have questions, if you're just exploring faith and you're, you, you want a place where you can freely talk about things and, you know, be honest and ask the hard questions. And whether you're starting in your faith journey or maybe you're, you've been in it for a while, but you would like to grow more and... It, that's what Alpha is for. And there's free dinner and great community. <laughs> yes. That's a huge piece. It's a great place to get connected with people here as well. Um, but one of the big things that is really cool about Alpha is the, the power of the ask, the power of the invite. Um, take a look at this video that we have. It kind of gives a little clearer picture on that. This old friend of mine, Helen. My best friend. My friend called and invited me to try Alpha. Y recuerdo que mi papá me dijo, mira, hay comida gratis, ve. They handed me a invitation. It was just a random invitation. And I said like, why not, why not, let's try it. Why not, let's go. And I found like a, like a really awesome community of people. They helped me find who I was just by listening. Alpha helped me in the knowing of God. Empecé a entender que el amor I just knew. I was a different person from that moment on. I knew I had purpose. I, I felt really comfortable in like starting to invite my friends. I've seen Alpha really impact people that I work with. I would definitely encourage people to get involved. It's one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. It all turned out to be life changing. Yes, yeah, so, so if you would like to come and invite somebody, bring somebody along with you, we have invitation cards out in the lobby today. You can just grab some on your way out and just plan to do this with somebody that you know. You can sign up on our website or on our app. Yeah, that's all we have for you guys. We hope you have a great service. Hey, good morning. We are excited to worship with you all here this morning. Um, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, can I be vulnerable this morning for just a minute? Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Getting some maybes. Yeah, okay, I got a head nod. Um, so this song, Egypt, that, that we're opening up with has been like uh, one of those like anthem songs for me, uh, especially over the course of this, this last year. Um, I think a lot of us kind of, you know, has felt some of this displacement. Um, for me, like just a lot of things changed, and it was uh, and has been a hard year. But this this idea of um, of a cloud by day and a fire by night guiding um, has just like 
been so, so true. And um, it's one of those things where like, before I would kind of sit down and I'd pray and I'd ask God for his provision. And then I just started sitting down and thanking him for his provision. Cause like you see the cloud, you see him moving and, and all of a sudden you get to be a part of, of what God is doing and, and, and where he's going, you know, um, rather than just kind of going your own way and, uh, hoping it, hoping it's fine. Right. But the cloud, it doesn't always move where you want it to, you know? <laughs> um, and, and that's been, that's been interesting to learn, but like, I still see that kind of Psalm 23, you know, where, where, where God is my shepherd and he, and he guides me and he leads me down, down paths that I need to go down, you know, and sometimes they're valleys of darkness and, and struggle and, and sometimes they're, they're green meadows that I get to lie in, you know. Um, so I don't know where you guys are at this morning, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to sing Egypt with you all. Um, and just as we reflect upon uh, just where God's going and, and how we get to join in on, on what he's doing. So if you're here and you're able, uh, would you stand with us? Lord God, we thank you. Um, we thank you that you have purpose, that you are the living God. Um, thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing. Um, we're just excited to, to meet with you, to worship you here this morning. In your awesome, your powerful name we pray. Amen. wonder of how you brought deliverance the exodus of my heart you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah day is a sign that you are with me. The fire by night is the guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of
Father, you, you are the God of victory. We thank you that our hope is in you today. Our joy is in you. Our strength is in you. You are an amazing, powerful, loving God, and we are here to praise you. We love you, God. And I thank you, Lord. We thank you that you, you are a God who's, who steps into our Egypt. You, you step into these places where we are and we don't want to be, where we feel overwhelmed, we feel hopeless, we feel um, like we're in bondage. And yet you meet us in those places. This isn't about us cleaning up our lives to somehow get to you. You meet us there. And we're so thankful and I pray for each one of us, those who are watching our live stream, those who are here in person, God, that you would meet us right now, right where we are, are right where we are in this place today. Whatever burdens we are carrying, whatever emotions we are experiencing, you are with us. And we're so grateful. So Holy Spirit, we open our hearts to all that you wanna do. We say yes to you. We ask you to speak to us from your word. We pray that you would bring life and hope and impact in our lives as you meet us here. So speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. Those of you who are here in person, welcome to all of you who are here and those who are watching our live stream. Really, really thrilled that you are with us and that we're in this um, together. You've carved out this time in your day to... Um, be with the Lord, be with other people, experience the Lord. And so it's gonna be good. Um, before I jump into the message, I wanted to, I've mentioned this for a couple weeks, but I wanted to just uh, one more time, just invite you to join me in a, in a journey that I personally am on regarding this idea of joy. So for the past several months, I've been diving into this, this topic of joy and I've been learning some really cool and practical things about how we can experience more joy. A lot of it has to do not only with, with the recent brain research as well as biblical theology. And when you bring those together, it can be very, very powerful. And so I honestly, I can't wait to share with you what I am learning. Um, it's had a, a significant, it's having an, a significant impact on my own life and in my relationships. And so in two weeks, we're gonna start a series on joy and I'm just gonna share what I'm learning. And, and, uh, and I, I can't wait. I just wanna invite you to join with me in, in, in this discovery process. We're kind of gonna be journeying together. So that teaching series will start in, in two weeks. And if you're able to do this as a group, in a group, that's even more fun. Uh, that would be better. Um, and so if you want more information about getting in a group or starting a group, you can go on our app or our website or just talk to any of our, our staff. Or if you're on live stream, just uh, do something in that chat box there and someone will connect with you about that. Okay, today we're actually finishing up this teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, for the past, I think it's been six months. I haven't looked exactly, but for the past six months, we have been walking verse by verse through this amazing sermon that Jesus gave in Matthew chapters five to seven, where Jesus describes for us what it looks like to live as people of his kingdom, to live our lives according to the things that Jesus values. And I can't emphasize enough how significant and how important this Sermon on the Mount is. I mean, in it, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about nearly every area of our lives. He talks about our purpose, our money, our relationships, our prayer life, our sexuality, our anxiety, our attitude towards people that we don't like very much or you know, we don't agree with. In these three chapters, Jesus gives us this incredible summary of what it looks like to follow him. What it looks like to follow him. And I'm honestly, I'm a little sad that this series is concluding because this, this, this stuff in the Sermon on the Mount is so applicable to our culture today, our society. It is so applicable to us. In fact, I joked with someone the other day that I was tempted next week just to start <clears throat> in chapter five, verse one, to see if anyone notices. We just kind of start over again. Um, but, you know, because this is, this is not the kind of thing that we master 
in one teaching series. What Jesus is describing is a way of life. And so I would encourage all of us to continue to spend time in the Sermon on the Mount, whatever that looks like. If you miss some of the messages, maybe while you're exercising, you can uh, listen to some of the, 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 the messages in this series from our app. You can do that. I heard a pastor share recently how every day in his prayer time with the Lord, he prays through the Beatitudes. I thought, that is so cool. He prays through the Beatitudes, which is the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, praying that his life would reflect this purity of heart and being merciful and hungering and thirsting for righteousness and peacemaking. I thought, that is so cool. However we can get the truths of this Sermon on the Mount more deeply rooted into our hearts is worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Well, in the passage that we're looking at today, Jesus brings this entire Sermon on the Mount to a powerful conclusion, and it's based upon a simple idea. Here's the idea. The quality of our life is dependent upon the choices we make. Okay, so when I was growing up, our family played this game called Life. How many of you have played the game of life? Okay, a lot of you. Um, so, and, and then when my kids were young, they found this game, this board game in my grandma and grandpa's, you know, in, in, my, in their grandma and grandpa's closet. And so they love to play it as well. I checked on Amazon. It's still a thing, actually. It's still a thing. But the newer version doesn't look nearly as, as fun as the classic version. I mean, the convertibles have become minivans. Seriously, uh, you, you, could, you can acquire pets instead of children, whatever. Okay, but anyway, um, this game is fascinating because it leads you through the circumstances of life, right? Where you get a career and, and marriage and then children and then buying a home and, and then hopefully buying insurance and all that, all the way to the end where you end up either in millionaire acres or, you remember, the poor farm, yes, okay. So it was a really fun game, and it had, you know, um, had, had, had certain elements of real life in it. But there was one thing about this game that wasn't a reflection of real life. Everything that happened to you in the game depended upon that plastic spinner. Do you remember the spinner, right? And the annoying noise that it made, or whatever. But your career and salary and various other choices in life were completely dependent upon chance, upon whatever number came up when you spun that dial. So then when you get to the end of the game, you realize whether you won or lost was, in, was really largely dependent upon chance. But according to Jesus, that's not how real life works. The quality of our life is not something that is left to chance. It's actually left to choice. The choices we make. See, this is Jesus' emphasis as he brings this entire Sermon on the Mount to a very significant conclusion. All right, so listen to how he ends this message. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It'll be on the screen too. Therefore, which refers to everything else he's said, Matthew 5 to 7, this whole sermon. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is God's word. Okay, what a, what a powerful and vivid way for Jesus to conclude this sermon. He uses the analogy of building a house in order to contrast two very different ways of living. These two people he describes, are each, each of them are building a house. Now, in that culture, a person's house or home represented all of their life. People lived, multiple generations of a family lived in a home. So it was a place for family and social interaction. It was often a place where people pursued vocations like weaving or, or a carpentry or whatever. And so in this passage, Jesus is using a, a very common analogy in that day to describe a very, and to declare a very significant truth. Every person is building a life. Every person is building a life. Both of these people are building a home. They are, they are building their lives. They're using the same basic materials. All of us have the same basic materials to, uh, upon which to build our lives, with which to build our lives, time and relationships and choices. But the quality of the life they're building 
is radically different. And the reason, the reason is not because of how they happen to spin some dial on a game board. No, the reason is because of the choices they made. The foundation upon which each of them chose to build their life. See, Jesus' analogy here is so brilliant because it automatically draws every one of us, it draws every one of us into this story. See, the question is not, are you building a life? All of us are building a life. Whether you're in middle school or high school or you're a college student, you're pursuing a career, you're having a family, you're near retirement, you're in retirement, doesn't matter. All of us are building a life. That's not the question he's raising. The question is, what kind of life are you building? What kind of life are you building? What quality of life are you and I choosing to pursue? That's the question that Jesus is urging each one of us to ask of ourselves. And and as we see in this passage, this question is not a superficial question. It is not a trivial question. No, this question is perhaps the most important question that you could ever ask of yourself because the implications of this question are so staggering. As Jesus describes in this passage, one path results in a life that completely collapses when a storm hits. There's not enough strength, there's not enough resilience, there's not enough stability to stand in the midst of the life's challenges, to flourish in the midst of of life's circumstances. So that's one, one, one path. And then the other choice results in a path, in a life in, that's able to stand strong uh, in the winds and the rain and the storms hit. And, and the storms of life will hit. But this particular example, the house stands strong. Now, there's, a, there's an important biblical word that I think accurately describes the person I, I just mentioned. And it's the Hebrew word shalom. The word shalom is a very important word in the Bible. Often the word shalom is translated peace, and it means that, but we typically think of peace of mind, which is part of shalom, but shalom is so much bigger than that. Shalom is a whole-bodied peace. Shalom speaks of a peace and a thriving in every area of our lives. It speaks of wholeness, of maturity, an experience of well-being and calm no matter what life throws at us. See, that's the picture Jesus is giving us here. A path in which this person experiences true shalom, right? The the strength, this thriving, this wellness of being in the midst of life's storms. Again, the contrast Jesus describes raises this really important question. What kind of life do you want to build? What kind of life do you want to build? Each one of us has a choice as to which of these two experiences will be ours. This is not up to chance. It is up to our choices. Okay, so what is it that distinguishes between these two very different, very different, radically different experiences of life? Well, well, Jesus makes it very clear what the difference is. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about the posture of our heart toward Jesus. He says that both of these people, notice, both of these people hear his words. Both of them, both of them understand his teaching. That's not the issue. They both hear his words, they both understand his teaching. The difference is that one of them chooses to put into practice Jesus' teaching, and the other one chooses not to. Now think with me for just a moment of the audacity of Jesus' words. I mean, if someone were to come up to you and, and, and say, you know, you need to do what I say or your life is going to fall apart. You'd be like, who are you? you know? <laughs> what, who are you to say that to me? But Jesus does say that. He says that. He, he is making this astounding claim here. He is claiming to be the authority on how life is to be lived. In fact, look with me at the next two verses, verses 28 and 29, where we see how the crowd responds to the Sermon on the Mount, all right? Look what happens. When Jesus had finished saying these things, this whole sermon, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. See, the rabbis and the teachers of the law in that day, they, they would base their authority on whatever rabbi they happen to be following. 
So they'd have a group of people following them and they were basing their authority, oh, I follow this rabbi. And another teacher would say, well, I follow that rabbi. Jesus never said that, ever. Because Jesus isn't following some other rabbi's authority. Jesus claims to actually be that authority. In fact, just a few verses earlier, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is claiming to be Lord. He is claiming to have the authority on the final day of judgment to dismiss from his presence religious fakes who don't truly know him. Jesus is claiming this authority to tell us the best way to live our lives. <laughs> He's claiming that authority. I mean, th this is the foundational question that Jesus is driving at in this passage. Who is the ultimate authority in your life? And in my life, who's calling the shots? Who's the ultimate authority? Is, is it Jesus' teaching as described in the Bible? Or is it something else? Is it the opinions of our friends? Or things we're reading about on the internet? Or the kind of values of our culture? Or is it our own preferences? Who, who is determining these choices, in other words, who is truly Lord of our lives? According to Jesus, again, this is just what Jesus says. According to Jesus, that decision, who's Lord of our life, that decision determines, it determines the foundation upon which we build our lives. That decision determines the quality of life that we will experience. So just imagine with me, let's say you're, you've got this dream home and you're, you, you've hired an architect to plan it out, and you've got all the financing, and you're watching this be built, and it's just this amazing house. It's everything you ever wanted, and so this is built, and all the effort and finances and materials. The house is built, but it's built on a foundation of sand. So it doesn't matter how awesome the house is. It doesn't matter how comfortable it feels, how cozy the living room is, how amazing the fireplace is, how cool the appliances are, how well insulated the walls are, what kind of roof and shingles it has. It doesn't matter. It is that house, no matter how awesome it is, it is one storm away from entirely collapsing because it's built on sand. Our lives may seem like things are pretty good. But if we're not building on the foundation of Jesus by putting his teaching into practice, we too are just one storm away from things falling apart. Okay, now, this is really important because usually, and this, is, this is a pretty familiar story. If you, you know, grew up in church at all, if any of you did in the flannel graphs and all that, you probably had this story told to you many times or whatever. Usually, there's a problem though when we interpret the, the way we interpret this story because usually when we hear this story, we think of it in a binary way. In other words, here's how we think of it. You're either the person who's built your life on the rock or you're the person who's built your life on the sand. You're either one or the other. In fact, some Christians will import salvation onto this text and they'll say this text is, is talking about who's going to heaven and who's not. Well, when we view this passage through, through that kind of reductionistic lens, we end up, we honestly, we end up letting ourselves off the hook. Oh, I'm saved. Jesus is my foundation. And when we do that, I think we completely miss the point that Jesus is making. It actually causes us to miss the power and the relevance and impact of Jesus' words in each one of our lives. See, this passage is not about salvation in the typical way Christians think about it. Have you prayed some prayer? Are you in or out? No, this passage is not about us getting to heaven. It's about getting heaven into us into every area of our lives. I love how um, pastor and author John Mark Comer um, states this. Here's what he says. He's talking about the gospel, but it applies to this. He says, this is not about a, a transaction, but a transformation. It's not about what God wants to do for us, but what God wants to do in us. It's not just about what happens when we die, but what happens if we live 
This passage is about whether or not we will choose to experience life and shalom and wholeness now. It's about whether or not we will choose to become someone who lives and loves like Jesus right now, which changes our whole, it changes the whole perspective on how we view this passage. See, what I believe Jesus is saying, and this is consistent with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, and, there, and here's what I think he's saying. He's saying there are, there are multiple areas of our lives in which we are either choosing to build on a foundation of rock or we're choosing to build on a foundation of sand. Depending on what we do with Jesus teaching in that area. Okay, so let me give an example. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about forgiveness. He commands us to forgive those who hurt us. And when we do that, even though it's not easy, it is not easy to forgive, we all know that, but when we do that, we are choosing shalom. We are actually choosing life. We are choosing to build this portion of our lives on Jesus and, and, and to be formed into his image. But when we choose not to forgive someone who hurt us, when we choose to hold on to our bitterness and our grudges and our hatred, and we feel, because it feels good to do that, you know, to kind of hate this person. When we hold on to that, even though Jesus says not to, when we choose to do that, we are building that area of our life on sand. We are choosing what we think is best rather than what Jesus commands. And there are consequences to that decision, but not the consequences we typically think about. See, here's the deal. We typically think of the consequences of disobeying Jesus in terms of some eternal judgment in the future, but that's not what Jesus is focusing on here in this passage. He's talking about what happens in our lives today when this part of our life is being built on sand. See, the consequences of choosing not to forgive is not simply some punishment that will happen somewhere in eternity. No, it's the consequences that happen now. Bitterness is like a poison. It's like drinking a poison. It eats away at our joy. It robs us of peace. It's, it's a toxicity that seeps into all of our relationships. We think it's just about this person and us. Well, I'm just going to harbor a grudge, to hold on to a grudge towards them, but all my other relationships are fine. No, it doesn't work that way. This, the root of bitterness here, seeps into all of our relationships. It can even cause physical problems. I was talking with someone a couple weeks ago after a service. He told me a story about a woman who was receiving prayer from a, a, a prayer team. For phys, she, she needed physical healing in some area of her body, and so they were praying for her. And as the team was praying for her, someone had this impression that this woman had someone that she needed to forgive. And so they stopped the prayer time, and they just asked this woman, is there someone that you need to forgive? I just have the sense that maybe there is. And she acknowledged that there's a person in her family that she has had a great deal of hurt from this person and just harbored bitterness towards them. And so they encouraged her, they kind of coached her in how to forgive, to bring this offense to the cross, to leave it there, not excusing the offense, we're bringing it to the cross so that we're not carrying it any longer. And we leave it there. That's what forgiveness is. This woman chose to forgive this person in their life. The next day, the physical ailment was completely gone. Completely gone. Shalom, right? Jesus is inviting us into an experience of shalom, of thriving, of life now, <laughs> now, in the present. When we choose to obey him, when we choose to practice his teaching, we are being formed into his image. Our life is actually growing in shalom now. The foundation of that area of our life is being built on the rock of Jesus now, which can stand up to any storm now, <laughs> in this life, but if we choose to not practice his teaching in some area of our life, if we decide, you know, I'm following Jesus all these other places, but over here, I'm not gonna do that because I know what's best. Whenever we do that, we are choosing to build that portion of our life on sand. Our choices will eventually undermine and erode the wholeness and the shalom that Jesus offers us. See, this parable 
this, this, this contrast between these two different people. It is, it is a brilliant way for Jesus to conclude the Sermon on the Mount because here's why it's brilliant. It forces each one of us to evaluate each area of our lives in terms of whether or not we are practicing what Jesus commands and to realize that that choice in whatever area it is that Jesus has addressed in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying those who put all this into practice, they're like building a house on, on, on the rock. And so he's forcing us to look at the Sermon on the Mount through that lens of every area of the Sermon on the Mount through this lens and, 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 and to see the choices that we're making in these various areas and to realize that those choices are actually impacting our experience of life now. What Jesus is doing here, it, what he's really doing, he's changing the whole paradigm of sin, right? The Bible talks about sin and churches, you know, we tend to talk about sin because the Bible talks about sin or whatever. But so often, I think people have such a shallow understanding of sin. You know, uh, people so often, here, here's, here's how I would summarize it. This is probably overstated. But so often people have this idea that sin is this decision to have a lot of fun in this life. And that really ticks God off. Um, and so one day, we better be ready for judgment because he's going to get us for whatever fun we had. He's going to punish people for their sin. But what I see more and more in Scripture and certainly in the teaching of Jesus is that that is such a shallow understanding of sin. Yeah, sin brings judgment, but, but the judgment it brings is primarily the natural consequences of choosing to build our lives on sand, right? The judgment that this person in the parable experienced was that their house collapsed. In this life, their house collapsed when a storm hit. They didn't have a solid foundation. See, that's, that's what sin does in our lives. We think, oh, it's, we're, it spoils our fun, all that stuff. No, no, that, this is what sin does in our lives. It erodes our experience of shalom. That's what it does. It erodes our experience of shalom. One of the words used for sin in the New Testament is this Greek word, hamartia, and it basically means missing the mark. So the idea is that an archer, a person shooting a, you know, with archery would measure how far they were off the bullseye. That would be hamartia. And that word then was used in the New Testament to talk about sin, so this idea of missing the mark. But the question is, what mark are we missing? And we would say, oh, well, that's holiness. The bullseye is holiness. Did you know that the word holiness, another English word that's very, very, they're linked, they're very, very similar, is the word wholeness. That's what holiness is. God is holy, meaning he is whole. He is complete. So think about that. What if the center of the, and I believe it is, the center of the bullseye is wholeness, so the mark that we miss when we sin is that we miss the wholeness and the shalom that Jesus longs for us to experience and honestly that we long to experience. We long for wholeness as well. The sins we commit usually are promising us wholeness and they don't. So we, we, the, the deeper longing in our heart is for wholeness. It's not for sin. But what if that's the bullseye? So what that means is that sin, sin causes us to miss out on true life. Now, in fact, sin, is, I mean, another way to say it, sin is really stressful, <laughs> right? It is. I mean, it's all the guilt and, the, and then the damage of the relationships, and then you, you lie to this person, and then you got to cover up over here, and you got to remember who you're, how you're covering up and making sure all, the, I mean, it's just, it's stressful. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, but, but in, in whatever area we're choosing to not follow Jesus' commands, that area is being built on sand. So now, if we, let's apply this really practically. So if we look back on the Sermon on the Mount, Second, any section of the Sermon on the Mount, and we look at it through this lens, let's just see how this plays out. Because again, I think it changes the whole paradigm on Christian life and sin and all that stuff. So here's an example. In chapter five, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about anger. He has this whole teaching in chapter five about how destructive anger is. In fact, it's like murder from God's eyes. And so it's, it's how destructive it is. It, that, that's why it's like murder in God's eyes. It's so destructive. But, and, and, and so he's talking about the, the damage of anger. Again, maybe not with a gun. It's not destroying people. But with gossip, with slanderous words on social media, 
maybe yelling at our kids. And so let me just ask this. Can can any of us here honestly say that our anger has brought us greater levels of shalom and relational wholeness? I can't say that. My anger, anger in my life has caused personal pain and relational damage. See, anger erodes our experience of relational wholeness. So so following Jesus in this area of anger, it makes complete sense, right? It makes complete sense. It is a good thing. Jesus is not trying to restrict us with his commands. He wants us to experience wholeness in our relationships. Another topic he brings up in that same section is lust, Sexual lust, Jesus addresses this in the Sermon on the Mount. He warns us about sexual lust, not to spoil our fun. He warns us because he knows how destructive sexual lust can be in our lives. In the moment, it feels really good, but it results in emptiness, guilt, and increasing loss of self-control and freedom as this starts to take more and more control of our lives. It results in a desensitizing of our emotions, just kind of a deadness inside. We don't feel really as much. It desensitizes our emotions. It results in a distance in relationships. We don't really want to engage other people in real relationships. It it results in an objectifying of people and using people created in God's image. I mean, again, this question, can any of us here honestly say that lust has brought greater levels of wholeness and shalom into our lives. But this is not only about sin, all right? I know those are kind of hard examples, but it's not only about sin. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about, he invites us into this life of prayerful intimacy with our Heavenly Father. Jesus says, you know, it's really cool if you create, you just have this secret place and you go in that secret place regularly and you just meet with your Heavenly Father and you share what's going on in your life, and you listen to him, and you create this intimate relationship. See, what's he talking about? He's talking about building part of our life on a rock, this intimate relationship with him. And later in that same chapter, in chapter six, Jesus talks about worry, and he says, stop, don't worry. Trust your heavenly father to provide for you. Don't chase after all these things and wonder what is gonna come. Your father knows what you need, so just seek first the kingdom, and he'll take care of it. You know, chill out. That's basically what he's saying. And in this passage, he says, look at this. I love this this statement. He's so practical here. Matthew 6, 27. He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? (laughs) I mean, in other words, Jesus is saying, you know what? Worry doesn't really help you or me in any way. It doesn't help us. He is so practical in his teaching Jesus knows how life works. He knows what will lead us into trouble, and he knows what will lead us into life. And so at the end of this amazing Sermon on the Mount, in which he's been teaching us all of these things, he urges us, he urges us to not only hear his teaching, but also to actually put it into practice because of the shalom and the wholeness and the strength that it will bring into our lives when we do that. It's pretty cool. The motivation he's giving us here, it's not don't sin because God's gonna be mad. No, it's for your sake, it's for my sake. It's for our shalom, our wholeness. So look again at this description. The, the, the um, wise person here, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine hear the word, and they put it in practice. This is what they're like. They're like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So the rain came down, streams rose, winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. This is such a powerful description of the life Jesus invites us to experience. And I want you to notice one particular word in the passage that we ju- I just read. Notice how Jesus describes this person. He doesn't say that they're pious. He doesn't say that they're holy. He doesn't say that they're religious. No, Jesus says the person who practices his teaching is wise. 
And that word wisdom, there, there are a couple of different words he could have used in the Greek. The word he used here for wisdom literally means intelligent, smart. That's what the word means. This is a person. He's describing a person who sees the empty promises the world offers and who sees the con. They're like, I know if I follow that path, I know exactly where that's going to lead. And then they see the wisdom of what Jesus is saying in terms of following him. And so they choose, they choose to practice what Jesus says. They're really smart. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not, oh, they're so spiritual and holy. No, they're just smart. <laughs> I mean, I love how practical, I love how Jesus' words here are not overly spiritual and holy. You know, he, he honestly, he's just talking about how life works. And he knows, but he's talking about how life works. Following Jesus is a, is a really smart way to live. Following Jesus is a smart, intelligent, wise way to live. It's not about being religious and blah, blah, blah. All that stuff. No, no, it's just smart. It is wise. It is intelligent to follow him. It, it has a positive impact on your heart. It has a positive impact on your, your, your relationships. It has a positive impact on your, your well-being. It has a positive impact on your experience of freedom and contentment and peace and joy. There is a maturity that happens, and that maturity causes this strength and resilience in the midst of the storms of life so that when those storms hit, You've been saying yes to Jesus over time. Those storms hit. It's like, you're just in shalom. You just, there's a calmness in the storm because your life is built on this foundation, right? Choice after choice after choice. That's what Jesus is inviting us to. In fact, I, 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 and this is not just at the end. It's so cool how Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount. For those of you here, you may remember, he starts with this thing called the Beatitudes, and he talks about these eight or so values of the kingdom, pure in heart, and uh, um, uh, hungering and thirst for righteousness, being merciful, those things. Every one of those, he starts with a particular word, a particular promise for the person who actually lives the way he's describing. Remember that word? What's the word? Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. <laughs> blessed, blessed, blessed. See, when we choose to follow Jesus, he says at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when we choose to follow Jesus, when we choose to align our lives with his commands as described in this whole Sermon on the Mount, we experience the blessing of shalom. We experience the blessing of wholeness, building our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that our lives will be rosy and easy and, oh, I'm a Christian, everything's gonna be great. No, it doesn't mean that at all. There will be storms, all of us. There will be storms. But in those storms, we will experience a joy, a stability, a calm strength because of the choices we have made. Again, every one of us here is building a life. Every one of us is building a life. If you're a student, you're pursuing a career, you're enjoying retirement, everything in between, everyone is building a life. The, the, the question is, what kind of life are you and I building? What kind of life are we building? What, what kind of ch choices are you and I making? Because again, Jesus' words, they're very sobering, and yet they're life-giving. Your choices matter. Our choices matter matter. Our choices determine whether or not our lives or a particular area of our lives are being built on sand or on a rock. Even choices that we don't think are that big of a deal. I remember my first week of college, 
I was 17 years old because my birthday's in early September, and so I hadn't turned 18 yet. So I'm young, right? Going to college, I went to Kansas State, and um, first time on my own, you know, really away from parents. And I don't know why, but they had that, like, it felt like a week where they don't go to school. That's just not a good idea. Uh, a bunch of students and no school going on. And so um, there were just a lot of things going on, a lot of influences that some of which were not good. And thankfully, during those first few days there, when I had first arrived, God put in my life, God had my path cross a guy named Steve Muldrup, who was an upperclassman. He was involved in a ministry called Ichthus, um, and he invited me to a Bible study. And I said yes. That decision, which seemed really small, kind of insignificant at the time, sure, I'll go. That decision had a huge impact on the trajectory of my entire life. See, our choices matter. Our choices matter. In every area of our lives, they matter. So, so let me ask, what choices, what choices are you facing right now? Or let me ask it even a little different. What choices are you making right now? Because some, and I include myself here, some of us, we're making choices already. And we're realizing that the choices we're making are causing that area of our life to be on sand. What choices are we facing? What choices are we making? And in what areas of your life is Jesus inviting you and me? And what areas is he inviting us to trust him enough to say yes to his commands and to let him establish your life in his strength and his shalom? Because that's what he promises. All right, let's pray. So let's just take, a, take a, a breath, just quiet our heart here. And this is really the most important moment in this service. We want the Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us. So let me just ask, encourage you to think about your life before the Lord right now. What choices are you making or are you facing at work, at school, at home, behind closed doors? What choices are you facing or making? And where is Jesus lovingly urging you to practice his commands, to say yes to him in that area? Just let the Lord speak to you. And as an area comes to mind, just tell him in the quiet of your heart, Jesus, I want to say yes to you. I want to say yes to you in this area because I know I know I'm building this on sand and I don't want to build it on sand. I want to say yes to you in this area. Just tell him that. And ask for his help to do that. Now there's another thing that keeps us from saying yes to Jesus and really going after following him with all of our heart. There's another thing that we all wrestle with and it's the shame, the guilt, and the regrets and the failure that we feel from mistakes in our past, from times when we didn't choose to follow Jesus. And our enemy would like nothing more than us just to carry that around like a ball and chain the rest of our lives. Oh, I can't really follow Jesus because I've messed up so bad. What a bunch of... You know what that is. Jesus died on the cross because of our failure. <laughs> That's why he went to the cross. He is big enough. He is our deliverer. He is our savior. He is big enough to take our failures and our regrets and our shame and in exchange to give us his life instead. 
and his forgiveness. And so I want to encourage you, if you're right now, you're feeling some shame or guilt or for failures, would you just take a moment right now and offer that to Jesus? Just bring it to him. Just admit it to him and let him take that that ball and chain you're carrying, that burden you're carrying, let him take that right now. Hand it to him. And just envision him forgiving you. That's what he does. He forgives us with his blood. He washes us clean. He gives us a new start over and over again if that's what we need. That's the kind of Savior he is. And I, I just sense there may be some of you here and you have never said yes to Jesus the way I'm describing. I'm not talking about being religious and going to church. I'm just talking about saying yes to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Not just a little prayer you pray. This is something in your heart where you're saying, yeah, I want to receive you as my Savior and I want to follow you. And if that's you, and like this is a decision moment for you, if that's you and you feel like Jesus is calling you to take this step, I want to pray a prayer right now um, um, to lead you. I'll just lead you in a prayer where you can kind of, you can say yes to Jesus as your Savior and Lord and enter into this relationship with him. Just pray in the quiet of your heart. Just pray along with me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my failures. I choose to place my trust in you alone, not in me. (laughs) I now receive your life. Come live in me. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me and transform me through the power of your presence in me. I want to follow you as Savior and Lord of my life. Help me do that, Holy Spirit. God, I pray for anyone who prayed that prayer. Help them grow in this relationship with you, this new commitment they've made. And and for those of you who made that commitment, man, Alpha, I encourage you to consider taking our Alpha course this fall. It would be a perfect next step for you. And all of us here, Lord, we're all saying we want to follow you. And so help us do that. We love you. We surrender our hearts to you. You know what's going on, Jesus. You are the authority. You know how life works. And we want to choose to align our lives with you, to practice your teaching, and to build our lives on you as a rock. So set us free right now as we respond to you in worship. As we open our hearts to you, meet us in this place, Lord. Move in our hearts and our lives. We love you, Lord. Just bring shalom in a deeper way, God. Thank you, Lord. Through the valley, let your 
above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadows In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough unless you come
of every song you could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Yeah, God, that's what we want. We want our lives to be built on your love. It happens as we trust you. You know what's best. We want to follow you, God. Fill us, Holy Spirit. We want to build our lives on the rock of your love, Lord. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in us. Continue that work. So let me mention just a couple of next steps. Uh, one, prayer, if you'd like to receive prayer. We have a, um, someone at our prayer station over there, and she would love to pray with you. I encourage you to take advantage of that. Secondly, if you're a college student, um, man, we have some amazing things going on for our college age um, folks. And, uh, and so I want to just welcome you back. If it's your first time back, man, we missed you guys, and we're so glad if you're checking out for the first time welcome. Um, we have a lot, we have these home groups for college students where once a week you just go to a family home-cooked meal and just hang out with other students in that family. We have uh, ministry to refugees and homeless things going, all sorts of cool opportunities. And so if you want to find out more, Pastor Stetson is going to be outside. There's a table set up um, for you college-age folks. And just head to that table just outside these front doors. You'll see Stetson there um, with the beard. And uh, he would love to visit with you about what's going on in the college area. Alpha, the Alpha invitations talked about earlier in the video announcements, they look like this and they're actually on an information table. We encourage you to pray about attending Alpha or invite someone. It is an amazing experience um, to, uh, to connect in community. If you feel like, hey, I don't really know anyone around, this is a great way to do that. And also just to explore what a relationship with Jesus looks like. And then you can invest in um, one of the responses to invest in what God's doing at Christ Community through financial giving, putting the Lord first in that way. There are a number of ways to give. They're on the screen. You can text to give. Use our app. You can use our giving stations. You can use our website. And uh, thank you for those of you who invest in, in what God is doing here, impacting people, not only in this community, but around the world. It is awesome uh, to be a part of, of that. So um, we're thrilled. I'm thrilled to invest in that. And I'm so thankful for all of you who do. All right, uh, I'm gonna dismiss you with a blessing. This is a classic blessing from the Old Testament and it's focused on shalom, all right? So I want you to just to receive this blessing from the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you shalom, give you peace in your entire being. For the glory of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you later. I'll be in the lobby if you want to hang out. All right, and meet. We'll see you later.